You're listening to the Future Tech Health Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Until I reached age 40, I never realized the obvious, that we all have medical issues, or we at least have a family member or close relation that had, has, or will have them in the future. Medicine and biological systems are the final frontier. Until we've conquered death, figured out how life began, cured cancer, and understood our purpose in the universe, there's a heck of a lot to talk about when it comes to our health. Future Tech Health means I'll be covering futuristic topics that are actually already in clinical trials or even starting to appear on shelves or by prescription or available for your own use. We dive deep into stem cells, CRISPR-Cas9, the science of sleep, epigenetics, medical testing, cancer, ketogenic diets, stem cells, aging, regenerative medicine, and more. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a serious medical problem. Remember, however, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoy the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and share it with friends. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Future Tech and Finding Genius podcast. I have Kay O'Donnell. She's a vice president of the Waltham Head Care Science Institute. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, her work with uh, animals and uh, microbiomes and all that interesting stuff. So, Kay, thanks for coming. You're very welcome. Very, very good to be here. Yeah. So, yeah, I've spoken to a lot of people about uh, the microbiome, but not in regards to pets and it's funny when I look at my dogs, I, I do think of them as, as, as uh, the homobionts and I realize they do have microbiomes and all that stuff, and, but I really don't know much about them. So tell me about uh, your work. What, what got you interested in this stuff in the first place? Um, well, uh, the Wealth and Pet Care Science Institute as remit is to understand what drives health and well-being in, in pets, cats, dogs, fish, horses. Um and the microbiome is one area that is a focus for us because uh, our understanding of microbiomes uh, that exist in all species, and they can exist in the gastrointestinal tract, in the mouth, on the skin, in the hair, um, that as we learn more, our understanding is that they have an influence on health. And, and part of our remit is to understand what is that influence and how do they influence health and how can we modulate the microbiome uh, to improve health and well-being uh, of cats, dogs, fish and, and horses. And so it's a very complex area because it's, uh, it's affected by, by very many different factors. Um, and it's one of the areas that we focus on along with biomarkers, human-animal interaction, um, all with the aim of understanding what drives pet health and well-being. So the microbiome is, in fact, a biomarker. Biomarker is something that is an indicator of, of the health status of a pet, in, in, in our case. Um, and we do a lot of work on trying to understand what biomarkers are relevant to monitor health, what biomarkers are relevant that indicate um, negative changes in health and what biomarkers are relevant to indicate positive uh, changes in health. Um, and, and to give you a, a little bit of an example um, around um, some of the biomarker work that we've done more generally, um, we've been looking uh, more closely at biomarkers that, that we have access to through the vast amount of data we have uh, from our veterinary business. Um, and in these are blood and urine and, and fecal biomarkers and understanding how they link to different health statuses. And, and one of the exciting developments that um, we've uh, launched very recently is a biomarker which helps us identify cats at high risk of chronic kidney disease, for example. Chronic kidney disease is the number one killer of cats over five years old. Um, it's uh, usually a progressive disease. We don't fully understand the cause. And it's typically diagnosed when 40 to 70% of kidney function is already lost. So it's very difficult to diagnose. And, and we have developed a, a, a diagnostic test, a predictive diagnostic test, which identifies cats at high risk of developing chronic kidney disease 
uh, two years earlier than when it would be typically diagnosed by a vet. Typically, it's diagnosed at um, blood and and urine parameters. Um, And this essentially um, is is kind of using, developing our understanding of biomarkers through the use of data and and clinical data and medical data. And essentially what we did is we we looked at the medical records of about 150,000 cats and 750,000 Banfield pet hospital patient visits over 20 years. Um, And we looked at how different biomarkers in blood and urine changed over time in cats that went on to develop chronic kidney disease and cats that didn't go on to develop chronic kidney disease. And actually what you see is very, very subtle changes in a range of different biomarkers, but incredibly difficult for us as humans, if you like, to understand which of those changes are relevant over time. And so we used artificial intelligence and computing equivalent to about 600,000 computing hours um, to develop an algorithm. Um, so it's it's one of these uh, AI algorithms that uh, we run on data that we collect routinely in our in our pet hospitals, and that allows us to identify cats at high risk of, di- of disease development uh, up to two years earlier than than would normally be diagnosed by a vet. So that's very ex- exciting, and and I think it tr- it kind of indicates, if you like, a change in the way we're approaching health of of pets um, in a much more proactive way. How can we assess health status? How can we intervene early? And how can we maintain good health status? Um, In this case, it's through an algorithm that identifies cats at high risk of developing chronic kidney disease. But in the future, it could well be, how do we identify um, biomarkers within the microbiome? that help us identify cats uh, or dogs at risk of of disease development or cats and dogs that are developing normally versus cats and dogs that are developing less normally. And so biomarkers is a very big area and microbiome is a a significant area within the uh, biomarker um, research program that, that we have. So it's very exciting. It allows us to be much more proactive Um, in terms of uh, addressing health issues of our pets. And, uh, you know, we see it as a mirror of what's happening in in human health as well, where we're using AI and we're using biomarkers as indications of health status so that we can intervene early. So what do you do, for example, if you know your cat is at high risk of um, developing chronic kidney disease early? There are lots of things you might do. You might look for specific comorbidities that we know exist with chronic kidney disease. Could be around uh, oral health. Uh, Cats with chronic kidney disease often have poor oral health, so you pay more attention to good oral health. You would ensure that your cat is well hydrated. You might look to ensure that your cat had a a good high-quality diet where you manage phosphorus intake. Um, You would ensure that your cat maintained a healthy weight, Um, and you would be checking on the litter habits of your cat to make sure that you spotted any differences early and again you had the opportunity to intervene early and so the whole idea of the work that we do at Waltham is how do we understand biomarkers and the microbiome within that to understand health status of cats and when that health status changes because our aim is to end is to identify very early changes in health status so at that point you can intervene early and change outcomes and improve uh, health span and quality of life of, of, of our pet. Okay, right. so uh, from what I understand, when people have pets, I mean, it's hard enough to get people to pay attention to their own health and do things when they're not feeling well or when things aren't going wrong. You know, we can't really talk to our pets. We can observe them, and I'm sure we do. But how do you catch things early, let's say, in a cat or a dog, especially a cat, which, you know, they seem to be pretty aloof. So what, you know, of course, all the basics, look at their litter, et cetera. What, what, what are some things now you've learned that you can tell people to look for in their pets that will show them early on something's going wrong? Uh, we would suggest that people uh, watch the behavior of their pets. And, and usually pet owners are pretty good at spotting changes in behavior of the pet, be those litter ha- habits, 
be those uh, the amount that their pet sleeps, uh, how how much they interact uh, with with either other pets or or, or uh, other people within the household. So we would suggest that 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 is one thing they should do. Um, I think another thing that it, that is increasingly common is routine health checks for pets. Um, as you you rightly said, you know pets can't tell us if they're not feeling so good. Um, and sometimes uh, it's not, it, it isn't immediately obvious by observation that something is wrong. So routine health checks for pets, which, you know, would probably involve, I mean, urine and blood tests, uh, would be good indications of, of when things start to move um, out of kilter a little bit and we start to see some shifts in health status. So those would be the first things uh, that I would suggest. So what, um, have, have you compared, um, I don't know if there are any, but cats that aren't domesticated or don't live in a home or dogs with ones that do to see if their microbiomes, for instance, are different? Um, we have, there has been studies on that look at, at cats in different environments, and we do know the microbiome is impacted by the environment, which makes it a little bit more complex uh, to understand what is what bits of the microbiome are affected by the health of the cat and what bits are affected by the environment in which it exists. Um, so I think, yes, we would expect to see uh, changes in cats operating in different environments. In terms of between wild state cats and, and domestic cats that live in households, we would expect to see some changes. I think it's also fair to say we don't fully understand the significance of, of those differences. Uh, at those points, we know they're different, but we're still at the stage of trying to um, pull apart, if you like, the data to understand what differences mean that a cat is healthier or what differences mean the cat is a le- less healthy. We understand some some very broad differences between profiles of, of uh, microbes that are present in the microbiome, but we don't fully understand it. And so there's a lot of work still to do in the microbiome. In terms of uh, biomarkers, what are you looking at? What are the ones that you predominantly use? And, you know, are they from blood? Are they from urine? Like, what's the easiest way? So I have a. I, I would say that the number of areas that we look at in biomarkers, uh, blood and urine, are are ones that we look at for more general health because they're routinely collected when when cats go for health checks at vets. Um, and so we have a lot of data in that area and, and they contain a lot of very useful data in terms of understanding uh, the health status of a cat. Other biomarkers that we look at maybe in saliva, uh, maybe swabs that we take from the oral cavity to help us understand oral health. We've done a lot, historically, we've done a lot of work on, on dog oral health um, and understanding um, what the oral microbiome looks like in healthy dogs and less healthy dogs when it comes to oral health. And then in, in feces, another area that we look at where we look at the fecal microbiome. And, and clearly, you know, you could argue you don't always need to look at the fecal microbiome to understand if a dog is healthy or unhealthy when you look at, at, at their poo. Sometimes it's obvious. But, but actually, some of the changes that we see in, in the microbiome profile in feces do help us identify what the cause of a problem may be. Um, and so this work is, is starting and developing now, uh, but, intend- uh, but the expectation is as we collect more data, we will become much more precise uh, around uh, what different microbiome profiles mean with respect to health, either immediate health or longer term health prospects of, of pets. Well, what are some interesting skews that you see, you know, pets that live in different areas, pets under different circumstances? I mean, what, what does the data show you already? Um, the, the data shows us that, that um, pets that have um, some GI diseases have um, significantly higher levels of certain bacterial species um, that, that are linked uh, to those conditions. And similarly, um, the data shows us that in uh, in healthy pets, you get a different profile. The other thing that, that our work has shown as well is that the profile of the microbiome, particularly the gut microbiome, changes in life stage. So if you look at the microbiome of a, in very early life, in very young puppies, for example, you will see a very unique 
peak microbiome. And then within, um, as the puppy get, grows and develops to an adult, you'll see another healthy microbiome. And as it develops to an older adult, you'll see another type of profile of a healthy microbiome. And as it develops to a very senior dog, you'll see a very different type of profile of healthy microbiome. So microbiomes, there isn't just one definition of what a healthy microbiome looks like. It changes as we age and it changes with the environment that we're in, which is why um, it's um, very uh, exciting, very challenging to try to understand what the impact of the external environment has on the microbiome and how that translates into what that means for the health status of the pet as well. So I would say we have a reasonably good idea of, of healthy status and, and very unhealthy status in different life stages, particularly in dogs. So, what, you know, specifically, what does that mean? Do you see that it's just a matter of uh, healthier dogs have more diversity? Like they always say in people, but they never get into the details of or I, you know, I what is it literally that you yeah. see that's interesting to you? I think diversity is one area um, that um, you, we would tend to. We tend to associate more diverse microbiomes with, with healthier microbiomes. Uh, there are some specific uh, bacterial species that we would associate with health and specific um, uh, higher frequency of bacterial species that we would associate with less healthy um, uh, dogs. And, and so it's, it's, not, it's not really about one necessarily one species uh, or one group of species. It, it's kind of what does the whole picture look like and how relevant is that picture, that profile of the microbiome to the dog that you're looking at in terms of um, the dog's age, where it lives, um, and what is normal and healthy for that life stage. So I, th- I think that's, that's what we're starting to understand now. Well, have you looked at uh, you know, microbiome profiles, let's say from yourself or from people? And compared it to dogs or cats, and you know, are they radically different? Are they somewhat different? Like, what, what's it look like between uh, humans and other animals and domesticated I think, animals? I think <laughs> there are some similarities and some differences. I would say, particularly GI microbiome, there are big differences because the other thing that we know is that the microbiome is affected by nutrition and diet. Uh, we know that we can move the microbiome in, in a certain direction, for example, by increasing fiber content of the diet. Um, and, and if you look at um, cats, for example, they're obligate carnivores. They have a very different um, microbiome to humans that are omnivores. Um, and we know that that impacts it. So some similarities, some differences. I would say similarly, um, we find in the oral microbiome, if you compare the oral microbiome of dogs and humans, uh, we see probably more differences than similarities. Not that surprising because our diets are very different. We eat much more refined carbohydrates as, as humans. And, and so um, that tends to promote um, higher levels of certain uh, bacterial species. So I, I would say in general, they're different. And, and so that said, sometimes you can make the same intervention and have a positive outcome. So in humans, you could have an intervention of uh, adding more fiber to diet and have a positive outcome. And if you had made the same intervention in dogs, again, you would have a positive outcome. So as I say, some similarities, some differences. So what will be the future of uh, pet health and interaction with people and pets? Do you think, um, I mean, you know, people have to change their behavior, possibly to, to take better care of their pets, or is the current way in which they take care of their pets acceptable? I mean, you know, what are some lessons they're getting early on from this work? I, I think the lessons that we're getting early on and, and the things that we're learning as we go is that um, there there is potential with pets, good potential in pets, in the same way there is in humans, to be much more proactive about our health and our health status. Um, so identifying um, identifying uh, areas where uh, we are at risk and making interventions to reduce that risk status um, early. And, and one of the examples that we have that is, is a product called Renal Tech, which identifies cats at high risk of chronic kidney disease. Um, two years earlier than any other, uh, it would be traditionally diagnosed. And so uh, that gives the cat owner the opportunity to intervene early 
and change the outcome potentially and improve the, the health span and quality of life of the cat. Have you um, looked at any other non-pet animals just to see if they have a microbiome or, you know, I, you know, I, I don't know, I wonder, I look at a fly and I assume that they probably have a microbiome and, you know, I wonder how far down it goes in simplicity. Do earthworms have one, for instance, you know, maybe you're not even looking, I'm sure you're really busy with, with pets, <laughs> as the ones, but what's your thoughts? Uh, well, in all honesty, we haven't looked, but other people do look. And, and uh, from the reported literature, uh, it, it would appear that um, many, many species, if not all, have microbiomes, uh, either on, on their, their skin, surface scales, fur, hair, uh, and also in the uh, guts, digestive tracts. Um, and, and they are different. Um, and... You know, I think the microbiome work, although there are a lot of people working on it, we are at early stages, if I'm entirely honest. We're at early stages of understanding um, how we manipulate and modulate the microbiome uh, to improve health generally in different circumstances. So we know general things. So we, we know if we increase fiber content and, and don't have extreme skews to either to, to only protein diets, um, then, then we can generate healthy microbiomes. But there is much more for us to learn. Um, they're very diverse. There are lots of people working in lots of different species uh, on the microbiome. Um, uh, our understanding is increasing. But in the spirit of transparency, we don't understand everything at the moment. We understand more about things like oral microbiome and, and GI microbiome, but, but some of the other work on skin microbiome is just starting. Well, what does that tell you that every animal we know of has a microbiome? I mean, does that tell you anything special or does it, you just say, okay, well, every animal has one and you know, off we go. Or does it tell you things? I, I, th I think that the assumption that you would make is, is that um, the, the fact that most of the species that have been looked at so far have a microbiome would suggest that they serve some form of function. And, and that function may be the same or it may be different depending on the species um, and, and also the constituents of the microbiome. And, and so I, I think it's we have to be where we can draw conclusions. For example, generally diversity in a microbiome is usually a good thing, um, but it's not the only thing that makes a microbiome good. Um, and, and so where we can draw conclusions and general conclusions, that's a good thing, but, but there are going to be subtleties within species and within different microbiomes that will impact the health outcomes of those microbiomes. And we don't understand all of that. Yeah. I was just thinking about animals, you know, they, well, until we started giving them what we call pet food, they all animals except us they eat raw things, essentially none of them cook it. So it'll preserve a lot of the bacteria and whatever they're eating, you know, in that animal, and I wonder what the interaction looks like. I was just wondering. I guess probably most animals that uh, you know, with, I don't know, snakes, dogs, cats, etc. I wonder what's happening to the interaction of the uh, again, the microbes of the thing they're eating versus theirs. Be interesting to look at, uh, you know, cats and dogs before they eat and after they eat. If you could, you know, uh, get an opportune poop sample and see what's different. For instance, I, well, I, I, as I say, I, th I think one thing we're very clear about is that what you eat will influence your micro, certainly your gut microbiome, and probably your mouth microbiome as well. Um, and and so we can demonstrate that that if we change the diet of of a dog or cat um, to a, a more refined diet, that we can get one microbiome profile, and then if we change it back to the original diet, it will revert back to the original microbiome that it started from. So I think that's clear. I think the challenge we have as, as scientists is, is translating that knowledge into so what? So, so what? You've changed the microbiome. What is the, the profile of a microbiome that, that drives health and well-being in a specific dog at a specific life stage um, and, and in a, a specific health status? And, and that's the work um, that we're starting to do. And, and as you know, as we know, it, that is available in clinical practice at the moment. Fecal microbiome uh, transplants um, are increasingly being used as a clinical intervention um, to improve the GI health of, of pets that are, are very sick and have chronic uh, GI distress. So where you're seeding the microbiome with health 
healthy microbiome from healthy dogs to try to um, seed the, the, micro, uh, the microorganisms to, to start to build a healthier profile of the microbiome in sick dogs. Oh, so you've observed that fecal transplants, or in the literature, fecal transplants have been used on dogs or cats, for instance? Yeah, they've been used in dogs um, and, and uh, generally with pretty good results. Um, and in the literature, you know, in humans, they're used, uh, they're used in humans as well. Um, and uh, particularly work for interventions with things like Clostridia difficile and, and this sort of thing. And again, with some degree of success. So, so again, that should give us confidence that, that microbiomes and good and healthy microbiomes can have a positive impact um, on, on pets and, and pet health. Well, very good. So w- what's the best way for people to find out more and to, uh, you know, to get in contact? Um, uh, by contacting Mars Pet Care. Um, you know, we're very happy to share the information that we have, to answer questions, um, to uh, by contacting their, their vets and the veterinarians, uh, you know, particularly if their if their pets are, are uh, don't appear to have a healthy microbiome or, or seem to be suffering from GI distre- distress, our, our recommendation would be go to your vet, get a get an assessment, get a diagnosis, and get some recommendations around what you can do to help. Well, very good. Okay, thank you for coming on the podcast. I appreciate it. You're very welcome. Thank you. You're listening to the Future Tech Health Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Until I reached age 40, I never realized the obvious, that we all have medical issues, or we at least have a family member or close relation that had, has, or will have them in the future. Medicine and biological systems are the final frontier. Until we've conquered death, figured out how life began, cured cancer, and understood our purpose in the universe, there's a heck of a lot to talk about when it comes to our health. Future Tech Health means I'll be covering futuristic topics that are actually already in clinical trials or even starting to appear on shelves or by prescription or available for your own use. We dive deep into stem cells, CRISPR-Cas9, the science of sleep, epigenetics, medical testing, cancer, ketogenic diets, stem cells, aging, regenerative medicine, and more. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a serious medical problem. Remember, however, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoy the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and share it with friends. Thank you.